Hey, I'm James, and in this video I'm going to discuss pelvic floor anatomy. This video is aimed at those who are wanting an introduction to this anatomy, or are after some revision content. Although this is a standalone video, it may be worth watching our video on the bony pelvis if you have not covered this anatomy already. Subscribe to Geeky Medics to be the first to know when we release new videos. Let's start with definitions. What are the pelvic floor muscles? This can cause a bit of confusion, so I will iron this out. The pelvic floor muscles are those highlighted on the model at the moment. The anterior group of muscles are known as levator ani. I will discuss this group later. The posterior muscle is coccygeus, which sometimes is known as ischiococcygeus. I would encourage you to use coccygeus though, as it is easily confused with one of the muscles in the levator ani group, and I will also get to that later. These muscles are innervated by nerves arising from the second to the fourth sacral spinal nerves. The pelvic floor helps to maintain fecal continence, supports the pelvic viscera, and resists intra-abdominal pressure. You can probably imagine that any structural weaknesses to this muscle group will result in organ prolapse. The levator ani group is a muscular sheet that consists primarily of three muscles, though other terms do get thrown around depending on the proximity of these fibres to certain structures. For simplicity, I will talk about the main three as these are the muscles that most of you will focus on. The first muscle I'll describe is pubococcygeus. Anteriorly, pubococcygeus is attached to the body of the pubis. The fibers pass posteriorly and converge at the midline to form the levator raphae, which you can see is continuous with the anococcygeal ligament. Importantly, some of the fibers will attach to the perineal body, which is a really important fiber and muscular structure that I will talk about in the perineum video. Here is iliococcygeus. It is attached to the ischial spine anteriorly and to the tendinous arch of the vasa ani, which would be located approximately here if this was included on the model. I will not describe the tendinous arch of the vasa ani here, but it is worth having a read around this structure because it offers structural support for the pelvic viscera. The posterior fibers of iliococcygeus attach to the raphae of the vasa ani and the anococcygeal ligament. The final muscle is puborectalis which is highlighted now, but if I rotate the model, we can see it slightly more clearly, as it is not really seen when looking within the pelvis. It originates from the ischiopubic rami. The fibers pass posterior to the rectum at the anorectal junction and merge with the fibers of the contralateral muscle. In fact, some fibers may also merge with the fibers of the external anal sphincter. The key thing you need to know about puborectalis is that it forms a sling around the rectum at the anorectal junction, which creates the anorectal angle. The tonic contraction of puborectalis maintains this angle at approximately 80 degrees, and you may have guessed that this action assists in maintaining continence. Coccygeus forms part of the pelvic floor, but is not part of the levator ani. Like I said before, this muscle is also known as ischiococcygeus, but I would encourage you to stick with coccygeus because it can cause quite a lot of confusion, especially considering as in humans iliococcygeus is attached to the ischium, not the ilium. So let's call the highlighted muscle on the model coccygeus. Coccygeus is attached to the ischial spine, sacrospinous ligament, and the coccyx. Now there are some other pelvic muscles that I want to briefly go over because they will feed forward into our video on the perineum. I will start with piriformis. This muscle attaches to the pelvic surface of the sacrum, leaves the pelvis via the greater sciatic foramen, and attaches to the greater trochanter of the femur. I would encourage you to remember how piriformis leaves the pelvis, as many other nerves and vessels leave the pelvis via the greater sciatic foramen, either superior or inferior to this muscle. Therefore, piriformis serves as a good reference point. Anyway, piriformis is innervated by branches of S1 and 2 and is a lateral rotator of the femur. The other muscle is obturator internus. It is attached to the pelvic surface of the obturator membrane and the surrounding bones of the obturator foramen. Fibers pass posteriorly and leave the pelvis via the lesser sciatic foramen and pretty much turns back on itself to attach to the greater trochanter of the femur. It is innervated by the nerve to obturator internus and is a lateral rotator of the femur. I am going to wrap up by briefly going over how most of the muscles that I've just described look when we look through the pelvic outlet. Just a brief recap, the pelvic outlet is this diamond shaped opening that is divided into the urogenital and anal triangles. But as you can see, this opening is essentially covered completely by the muscles of the pelvic floor. Well, except for two obvious gaps, the urogenital and anal hiatus, which allow for the urethra and anus to leave the pelvis respectively. 
the vagina also passes through urogenital hiatus in females. So that's me on the pelvic floor. In subsequent videos, we will look at the perineum and male and female reproductive anatomy. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you've thought of this video and what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. You can do this by leaving a comment or dropping us an email.